And so I'm going to invite you to um, turn with me to John chapter nine. I'm reading from the <coughs> Bible today. I apologize. I usually, uh, when I present via Zoom and put the text up, but that's not possible today. So I'll just, you know, invite you to to read along with me. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. I I, I have extensive ministry experience. I um, mostly with small churches. I preached with a small non instrumental church. It was in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, for years, and then Margaret, Alabama, small church, and then um, Cuna, Idaho, is a mission church, and then. I'm in Florence, Kentucky. I, I preached in a larger church there when I was doing that. But um, um, I, 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 I really have a heart for small churches. That's that's where my that's where my passion in ministry is at. And one of the things about small churches, really, I suppose, like large churches, is that we're looking at oftentimes at interactions among people that um, get things stuck, and sometimes. And our growth as Christians, we get stuck because we don't ask ourselves questions, reflective questions, or we look at things and we ask the wrong questions and so forth. So we see a whole lot here in John chapter 9. Now I invite you to read along with me. As he passed by, he being Jesus, he saw a man born, a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? So I think as Bible college students and faculty and others that are on here that have an affiliation with the Bible college, that's the kind of thing that I think a Bible college education helps us do, to pay attention to the types of questions we ask. In our context, questions we ask of the text. Quite take questions we ask of each other, questions we ask of other people, because our questions oftentimes limit the possibilities that we can see, or oftentimes limit um, the the options. And one of the things about that I've noticed through my years is that the people that grow most rapidly in the Lord are those that are curious, that ask a variety of questions and ask questions that aren't limiting. And beyond that, they ask questions of themselves that they that they reflect upon the questions that they ask. So I want us to look at this question. Rabbi who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind. And it says a lot about where the disciples are at. Not being judgmental of them because we all approach text with a worldview. We all uh, we all approach text with our pre-understandings, with our experiences, with our assumptions. And the one thing about a Bible college education that's worth its salt is that people really pour into their hermeneutics courses and exegetical type courses and learn to manage their presuppositions, to manage, to identify them, and to not let them dictate fully what they see from a text. In this case, it's a conversation with the master, and notice how Jesus answers. He says, it was neither that that this man sinned nor his parents, it, it was not, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So they do what the logicians call a false dichotomy. Did they sin? Did he sin or did his parents sin? Who sinned? And Jesus answered, neither nor. Neither this man sinned nor, nor his parents sinned, but if it was so that the work of God might be displayed in him. Now, can I ask you a personal question? When you see people in difficult question, situations, what are the questions that you ask? Do those questions limit your abilities to connect with them? Do those questions limit your abilities to understand their experiences? Do those questions limit what you can see and what you can't see? Do you self-monitor your questions to say, is there a better question? 
is there another question that I could ask? Because when we pay attention to our questions, and when we ask curious questions that we're reflective about, we'll surely grow. I also want to look at the master's answers because oftentimes people ask us questions. And sometimes those questions might be infuriating to us. We might look at someone and think, you Pharisee. Or we look at someone and say, you judgmental person or you narrow person or even at the opposite extreme, you liberal person. And so oftentimes, you know, our responses to questions might shut down the questioner from asking other questions. Do we really want that in ministry? Do we really want our hearers to shut down? Do we want the people that are engaging us in teaching in, in our teaching, engaging us in our Bible class um, rooms to shut down because of our responses to their questions? Or do we want to respond in ways that invites them to ask more questions or to invite them to ask questions of themselves, etc.? No one was better at this than Jesus. No one was better at this. Jesus truly was the master teacher. I used to teach a class here called um, Counseling Principles in the Ministry of Jesus. I don't even think that's in our catalog anymore. But I love that course because I gave people an assignment at the end to take a random walk through any gospel from the first chapter to the last chapter and journal about the repertoire of Jesus' behavior you see in there. You see a harsh Jesus with the money changers. You see a Jesus that tells a story, a parable, and he answers the parable. You see a Jesus that that ans- uh, that tells a parable and leaves it up to the hearers to interpret. You, you see Jesus asking questions and then responding to questions with more questions. You see a Jesus sometimes that responds very directly. So Jesus had this really wide repertoire of behavior that he responded with. And he, as being the master, being the perfect one, he always responded perfectly. And to the disciples' misguided question here, he responds just perfectly. Um, and then I think we <laughs> see something else in this story. Um, um, at, at verse 6, when he'd said this, he spat on the ground and made made um, clay in the spittle and applied the clay, clay to his eyes. This is going to be gross, but I'm going to ask you to do it. Close your eyes for just a moment. Close your eyes and listen to what happens. I don't think Jesus hacked like that. You can open him like that. But surely a man born blind with the with the sensitivity that a man born blind has could hear the spitting sound, could hear the splatter. And can you imagine this man may be thinking, this is another abuse. This is one other person taking advantage of me as a handicapped person as Jesus puts the mud on the man's eyes. He gives them an experience, if you will. And I wonder how much more our folks in our pews grow and learn when we give them an experience. Not only do we encourage them to to ask ask the right questions, not only do we respond to questions in a way that encourages them to ask more questions and expand their thinking so they can grow, but we also give them experiences. Think about how much of the work ministry of Jesus was experiential. Giving people experiences. In our teaching, in our preaching, do we give people experiences? It might get you fired depending on the church you're at, depending on who's in your audience. But I've done that exact thing with youth groups for years. Imagine them experiencing that. I've done that with certain congregations when I knew the makeup of the congregation, I'd be okay. Knew who might even be upset about it. But giving them experiences is very is something that we can certainly learn from. So, so what happens? He begins 
to see. And then this brouhaha comes. And after he begins to see, after he washes himself and goes to see, this brouhaha occurs. Starting in verse 8, Therefore the neighbors that's who and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not the, this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, How then are your eyes open? He answered, The man is called Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Salome and wash. So, that I, so I went away and washed, and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So this has really enacted something among people. And as we're going to see, it's going to stir the pot more. The disciples have already been challenged with the limited question they asked. The man was challenged because this guy spits on his eyes and tells him to go wash. He goes, wash, washes in obedience. He sees. And then the neighbors are all stirred. So they do what is natural. They bring him to the Pharisees and the, the man to the Pharisees. And, um, and, and so the fair, and it's on a Sabbath and, um, and tells them a story. Um, and then in the, the verse 15, the Pharisees also were asking him again, how he received a sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. A lesson here about not being a true seeker. A lesson here about being so fixed in our understandings of Scripture and our beliefs that we shut down things we don't understand. Shut down things that at first we don't look at. We There are many ways to not be a true seeker. One is just accept whatever people says as faith is value. The postmodern way, your truth is good as my truth. Your knowledge is good as my knowledge. That's one way to not be a truth seeker. Another way is what we <clears throat> religious folks do sometimes. And we pat ourselves on the backs well, and say is that we dismiss things we don't understand. We shut down questions about things we don't understand. We shut down questions about things that we can't answer and then pat ourselves on the back and say, we stood for the truth. No, we stood for keeping in our comfort zone. We stood for keeping the status quo, the status quo. Truth seekers seek out truth. Truth seekers um, explore scripture with an open mind, asking new questions, using sound hermeneutic principles. That's what truth seekers do. You don't want to be like the Pharisees. That was on Sabbath. And, and, and so what do they do? They say, they dismiss him and say, well, he did this on Sabbath. He can't be from God. And, but others were, but others were saying, he, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he's a prophet. And so the man stands for Jesus. But we know what goes on with this. We see that that it just starts to continue to unravel. In verse 18, the Jews then did not believe, believe it of him that he but that he'd been blind and received sight until they called the parents of the very one who was received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who was born blind? That then how does he see? His parents answered them and said, "We know that this is our son, and that he was being born that he was born blind, but now he sees. We did not, we do not know, or who opened his eyes. We do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Why did they say this? This is interesting. In one sense, they verified the story. Yes, our son was born blind. Yes, he's never seen. Yes, yeah, as seen. Yes, something happened. Somebody helped him. Ask him. He's of his age." But this is so telling, so telling of what happens when people are fearful. His parents answered them and said, we know this, our son is born, but I'm sorry. Um, his parents said, said this to them because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was going to be put out of the synagogue. 
For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Can I ask you a direct question? Not a question for you to answer. But do you see yourself in the parents and some of your interactions in the church and some of your interactions with the brethren? Do you sometimes stay quiet or not even ask the question or don't even go there because you're afraid? Because you're afraid of the dominant opinion. Because you're afraid to ask the question. Years ago, there was a person, I'm not going to say who the person was. He's a graduate of this, play, this place. I'm not affiliated with the school now, but I, I still know him. We've talked through the years. He came here as an 18-year-old. This is when I lived and taught here before. And I asked a question in the class, you know, about you know, about being truth seekers and you know why is it important for us to be truth seekers and as an 18 year old freshman again he's no one that's here now he answered the he raised his hand and said i'm here to be taught the truth i don't know the truth i want you to tell me the truth and whatever you and the other professor says i will know is true i had compassion for the young man because i think the young man came with a good heart I think the man came with an earnest uh, belief and an earnest um, quest for truth. And his trust probably was well-placed in some ways, you know, in, in, in knowing that people that were teaching him were more learned. Yet I knew that we would fail him in Bible college if he left with that understanding, that we would only succeed if we helped him to become a truth seeker, that knew how to rightly divide the word of God, knew rightly how, how to you know access the tools he needed to do this so that he could you know ask the questions of the text that he needed to ask. This man, not he's not affiliated with the Bible college now, but he's in a far different place than he was as an 18 year old. I have great joy in that. And I hope you do as well, because there's something to be said for that in a Bible college education, not being afraid to follow Jesus, not being afraid to pursue truth, not being afraid to truly be a truth seeker and a person that that invites conversation about truth rather than using it as what I call a rhetorical mood. There's a lot more people in ministry that engage in the rhetoric of truth, saying we have the truth, we promote the truth, we know the truth then there are people who are actively engaged in, in a passionate pursuit of truth. That's what a Bible college education should do for you, um, is to help you know how to pursue truth um, passionately. So I won't continue in this. We know what happens. It's just like a downward spiral among people. People are exposed. We see the worst in people, but we see the best in the young man. The young man, you know, says what happened and who did it. And I would like to think that the disciples strengthened their relationship with Jesus, expanded their repertoire and looking at those who had ailments, those who had infirmities, and to look at them. Because you see, if we don't understand something, we can say, it's related to sin. If we don't understand something, we can dismiss it out of pocket. And we're comfortable because we're comfortable in not having thought about it. We're comfortable because we haven't had to expand our comfort zone. We're comfortable because the boat hasn't been rocked. The truth seekers seek truth. Truth seekers seek the Lord. Now, one last thing, and it's going to seem like it's off topic, but it's not. Anytime I give a presentation on John 9, when I look at this, because I think we learn so much about ministry and about truth seeking from John 9, I invite anyone that's listening and thinking about, gee, I need to be a person that does these things, to look at the first eight chapters of Proverbs. 
just the first eight chapters. Because as you lean into the first eight chapters of Proverbs, you see the value of wisdom and all the things that are involved with being wise. So as we engage congregations in exploring the truth, we have to do it in a way that's wise. I know people that have not been able to stay in ministries, then they say they've been persecuted for truth's sake, but the truth is they've been persecuted for boorishness. They've been very boorish. They, they, they challenge folks, they shake folks up, and they ridicule folks, and then they're gone. I think you can be a truth seeker. I think you can do the things that Jesus did with the disciples and, and with the others here in the in a wise way, in the ways that Jesus did. Just in the beginning with the disciples, answering the way he answered, invited further explanation. In our context, since we're not the master, maybe we say, well, that's interesting. You think that someone sinned here. That's interesting. Could there be other possibilities? Why else could this have happened? You know, just just little things to expand our possibilities. Asking questions of the text, inviting people to ask questions of the text, approaching people with wisdom allows us to stay in the game a bit longer, allows us to have an impact on more people, because if we approach people with boorishness, with judgment on our own, we only cut off relationship, and we don't want to be people that cut off relationship. We want to be people that invite inquiry, that that promote truth seeking, and make it and making it something to be desired for the people in our churches to seek truth, because we're seeking truth. Message is yours. I thank you for your time and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.